I see you clearly now. I can see what you're wearing. Yeah, did you comb your hair? All those things. Praise the Lord. We did begin a, a series of messages, and I told you a while back, I'm not doing series for a while, and so this isn't a series, it's just a series, okay? I don't know how to say it. It's just we're going to be continually preaching on the Holy Spirit for a while, You and whatever you want to say. All right, so that's what's going to happen. <clears throat> um, and we started last week inviting the Holy Spirit, and just I'm going to take the time that's necessary that you can fully understand not only who the Holy Spirit is, how we uh, incorporate the Holy Spirit, how he becomes a part of our uh, walk with, with Christ and, and how he is vital to our success in becoming not only a disciple ourselves, but in making disciples. And so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about the weight and how important the weight on the Holy Spirit is. And so, if um, you have a Bible, you have an iPhone, an iPad, wherever Scripture is written on a t-shirt, pull it out. We're going to take a look at it. And uh, I want to I want to share with you. Um, an Old Testament story, and then we're going to move into the New Testament. But um, I'm going to start by telling you there was this uh, couple who invited a pastor over for dinner. And uh, he came over to eat, and then after he left, they noticed that one of the spoons were missing. His spoon actually was missing. And, <clears throat> and the wife said, I think the pastor stole our spoon. And... Uh, so a long time, like a year goes by, they can't find the spoon, and they're still, the pastor stole the spoon. And so they thought, well, let's invite him back again. Another year goes around, so they invite him back for dinner. And while he's there, he just gets the best of the wife. And she says, Pastor, I got to ask you, did, last time you were here, did you steal that spoon? And he said, that, well, I did take it, and then I stuck it in your Bible. <laughs> All right, let's open it up this morning. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so in the Old Testament, it was never God's design to have a king for the people. His design was for him to be the king. And there came a time when Israel saw the other nations. They had kings, and they said, we want a king, we want a king. And the prophet Samuel was actually ruling the nation at the time through the Lord. He was a prophet, and he was also acting as priest. And the Lord says, the people want a, a king. Give them, I'll give them a king. But there's going to be problems, I'm telling you now, and they're going to have to work that out. And he says, okay. So he brings Saul along. And he raises up Saul and says, here's your king, and everybody's happy. Well, most people were happy. Not all of them were happy. Uh, they, some of them didn't trust him right away. And so Saul becomes the king, and then there's a, uh, they, uh, Samuel anoints him, but not everybody's on board, and then so there's an army that attacks them, and Saul rises to the occasion, gets the, the, uh, the, the Israelites, they fight the Ammonites, they defeat them, and then so some more people are like, okay, we can keep him as king now. And then Samuel tells him this, and so we're going to start this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 10, and Samuel tells Saul this. He says, go down, verse 8, 1 Samuel 10, 8, you there? Okay. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, he's talking to Saul, I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you, everybody say you, you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you're to do. Okay? So there's a, uh, Samuel sees now that there's an opportunity. The people are on board. So he's going to come down, join with Saul in the public. And he's going to, Samuel is going to offer up the sacrifice because that's what the priests did. 
and then there would be this recognition of who Saul was, et cetera, et cetera. And so he tells him, though, something very specific. Wait till I get there. Wait till I get there. So I'm, I have subscribe and save with Amazon for some, some things that come in once a month. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Right, because you can save money, you, get, you know, whatever. So it was supposed to come in last week, and it gives me the update. Subscribe and save is, you know, being shipped. And then all of a sudden, the day I'm waiting for it to come, it doesn't come, and I'm waiting, and nothing, nothing. And then I get an email that says, oh, uh, your shipment's been delayed. I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. Even though I pay you guys good money every year to get it here early for me, okay. You know, they've gotten real slack about that too, by the way. Anyway, so I don't have an issue, right? So I'm, I'm waiting for the subscribe and save. So it doesn't come, and then it says, you know, the next day. So I, the next day I'm waiting, and then the next day I get a notification that says, oh, your subscribe and save is delayed. It's not coming. I was like, all right two days, I can wait, sure. The next day, I get another notification that says, your subscribe and save has been delayed, and if it doesn't come by the 25th of this month, you can get a refund. And I said, if it doesn't come by the 25th of this month, some Amazonian heads are going to roll. <laughs> now, that's what I'm thinking in my head, right? You know, because we, we watch too many Equalizer movies and things like that, where we're just... <clears throat> Yeah. So I realized in this moment, I'm like, man, I need, I need help, Holy Spirit. I need some help. Because why? We don't like to wait. You know, there's something very important that happens in the waiting. There's a spirit of humility that gets developed in us. And do you know that the Holy Spirit will only reside where there's a humbled heart? He, he will not come into a place that's prideful. He will not bless a heart that's prideful and arrogant. David says, a broken and a contrite heart, Lord, you will not despise. And so there's something about the waiting that produces a humility in us because it says, I'm out of control. So I'm going to submit my control now to the one who is in control. Right? Right? Well, let's skip over to chapter 13 and find out what happens. Bum, bum, bum. Verse 5. It says, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel. Okay, let me pause. So in the meantime, Saul's son, Jonathan, picks a fight with some Philistines. And when he does, it ticks off the whole nation of, of Philistia. So they get the army... And now they're coming against Israel. And this is where we pick this up. So the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth Aven. And when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical, that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pipes and cisterns. Isn't this the kind of army you want to lead? Things got tough and they went and hid behind the rocks. Verse 7, some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Some of the, some of the soldiers said, no, I'm, I didn't sign up for this. I'm out of here. I'm gone. How would you like that to be the beginning of your kingship? Now here, let's keep reading here. It says, Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him, listen closely, were quaking with fear. Verse 8, he waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. There are three things that happen here. It says that Saul's men were quaking with fear, all of them were quaking with fear. That Samuel doesn't come when he said he was going to, or at least when Saul thought he should. And then it says the men began to scatter. There was fear, 
disappointment and desperation. And when we allow fear, disappointment, or desperation to control us, the Holy Spirit will not. And so they're, they're in this moment here, and Saul says, verse 9, so he said, this is Saul, bring me. Everybody say me. You know that sometimes me is not the answer. But me is always there, isn't me? He or she. It's like a cat in a hat story. Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. This was a violation of the, the rights of a priest. Only they were anointed to do this. Saul was not a priest. He was a king. Samuel acted as a prophet and a priest. Jesus would eventually come to fulfill the office of prophet, priest, and king. But there was no one on earth at that time who had all of those offices. And Saul decides to do what God was supposed to do through Samuel. And here's the results. It says, bring me the burnt offering. Verse 10, just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. I bet he did. Hey. Is that a knife behind your back, Saul? No. You know when God's timing is? Right after you've decided that it was your timing. But I waited. How long did you wait? Well, I waited. Was the day over with yet? No. Seven days. He said to wait. And Saul, because of fear, disappointment, desperation, took matters into his own hands. Instead of waiting, now here's, here's what's important to make this connection. Samuel represents the presence of God. Okay? So Samuel hasn't showed up, and Saul decides he's going to invoke the presence of God himself and it was not his place he was told to do what wait wait and he doesn't wait he takes matters into his own hands just as he finished just as he finished proverbs 12 15 says that the ways of a fool are wise in his eyes. But a wise man seeks counsel. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. There's a way that I think is the right way to go. There's a way that I, matter of fact, let's just keep reading and find out what happens here. Just as he finished, in verse 11, Samuel shows up and says, What have you done? like every good mother says to a child. What have you done? And Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering, you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling, okay, there it is. When I saw, in other words, from my viewpoint, not God's viewpoint, not based on God's word, not based on what God said, but based on what I saw. I saw with my natural eyes, not my spiritual eyes. He says, I saw fear, desperation, and disappointment. I saw it, and therefore, verse 12, I fought. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offerings. I thought and I felt. Your thinking and your feelings will never 
line you up with the Spirit of God if you're not waiting on Him. I thought and I felt. Well, unless you thought and felt what the Holy Spirit was telling you, unless it was lined up with what the Holy Spirit said to do, you know, I thought I was supposed to wait, so I waited. Okay, that's right. I thought I was supposed to wait, but then I didn't see you come, so I took matters into my own hands. <clears throat> Wrong answer. My, my feelings and my thinking are never good substitutes for waiting on God. And then he says this, verse 13. Samuel says, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your, the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So not waiting on the Lord is not only foolish, it's costly. It cost Saul his kingdom. And it wasn't his kingdom, it was God's kingdom, but he was the king on the earth. But it cost him the power. Saul will continue to sit in the seat on the throne for years to go. But he was powerless. And the Bible also says that he was also tormented the rest of his days. So much so that David had to come in and play a harp later just to drive the demons away from him. So that he could have peace for a moment. Not waiting on God is not only foolish, but it's costly. We want and we need the presence of God. We need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to accomplish His will on the earth. And that, that will mean that you're going to have to wait for Him at times when your flesh says, but I have an answer, but I have a solution. Well, have you sought the Lord? What did the Lord say to you about it? Have you waited on Him to get an answer? Or did you just by best practices and previous experience decide, this is the way that it's always done, therefore I will do this? When David went into battle at various times, God would tell him specifically, this time you're going to do this. And they would do it, and he would say, circle around these trees, blow a horn three times, and whistle Yankee Doodle Dandy. And then... I will come and they would do it and boom not really okay but it was like that and then there'd be another time David would say hey you want us to do the Yankee Doodle thing again he goes nope this time I want you to sing the South's gonna rattle again all right so we're gonna and then they would conquer but David sought the Lord every time David would seek the Lord and God would give him direction you and I, just because somebody did something a certain way, just because Jesus spit in somebody's eyes to heal them, does not mean that if you see somebody with eye problems, you're to go over and, and I won't even go there. What is the Holy Spirit saying? What is the Holy Spirit saying? Now, let's fast forward. What does Jesus say about this in the book of Luke? And, and this was a the end of Jesus' ministry here, Luke 24. He's resurrected. He's about to leave earth. And in verse 49, he says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Stay in the city. Wait on the Lord. Stay in the city until you've been clothed, or in other versions say endued, or filled. Stay in the city until you have received the promise. What was the promise? The Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit was going to come and fill them and they would be endued with power. Stay in the city. Why did he tell them to stay in the city? Because he wanted this revelation and this revival to begin in the middle of a lot of people so that the ripple effects of it would, would flow out from, from there, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. It wouldn't be done tucked away in some little corner and nobody would know about it. He wanted it to happen right in the middle of a city because he wanted his people to be filled with power so that they would do what they were supposed to do. And what were they supposed to do? Well, Luke 4 tells, tells us he, when he's, he's sending his disciples out, he says to his disciples, Go and preach the kingdom of heaven has come. Then heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, do the things. That's what he told them to do. It was the shortest sermon ever. It's like, Jesus, what are we supposed to do? He says, all right, this is what you do. Go preach, tell people the kingdom of heaven has come. Period. Then... Heal the sick, cast out demons, see them people delivered, raise the dead, do the stuff. That's what they were supposed to do. When people, people sometimes, I've heard people, you know, they ask, what, you know, I, I, what's God's will for my life? Preach that the kingdom of heaven has come. Pray for the sick. See those that are oppressed to be delivered. Pray for them to be delivered. Cast out demons. Preach the gospel. Tell them that Jesus saves. No, no, no. I mean, like, am I, you know, am I supposed to become a doctor or a pilot? I'm, you know, what am I supposed to do with my life? Oh, well, pick. Which one do you, oh, I like doctor. Okay, good. Be a doctor and then go preach the kingdom. Cast out demons. Raise the dead. Heal the sick share the truth yeah but no 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 I mean am I supposed to be married I was wondering you know should I get married or not I don't know you want to get married yes well get married and then preach the kingdom that the kingdom has come that Jesus is alive heal the sick raise the dead cast out demons that's the will of God for your life we often get stuck on the small things and forget about the big things. We're asking God, What's, what do I do with my life? We told you very clearly. This is what you're supposed to do. Go preach that the kingdom of heaven has come. Heal the sick, lay hands on those, cast out demons. And we're, we're all about, you. Yeah, where, where do I live? Where do I kind of car should I buy? Should I get this controller or this controller? I don't know, just pick one. And then go preach the kingdom of God has come. Right? <laughs> Life in the spirit is not like the instant gratification that we live in right now. It's a wait. We're, we're so accustomed to Amazon delivering in two days that when it's three days, I'll pray for you guys who are struggling with that. <laughs> By the way, this waiting that he's talking about here, and we're going to get to it. Matter of fact, turn there, Acts chapter 1. It was 10 days, 10 days that they, they had to go, that they waited in the upper room. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm here, by the way. All right, here we go. 
chapter 4, chapter 1, verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but... Say it again all together, one, two, three. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he says a few days. It was ten. All right. But doesn't sometimes when God says wait, doesn't it feel like more than a few days? I mean, doesn't it just call to mind what the psalmist said, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years? Would you just wait a few days, says Jesus? Like a few thousand years is what it feels like. He says, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. That's a sermon there. We'll come back to some gear. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And then skip over to verse 14. So they, here's what happens. They return to Jerusalem. They go back and they, they go up into the upper room. And then in verse 14, it says, They all join together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. When the Holy Spirit came, there were 120 people in the upper room on that 10th day. When Jesus rose from the dead, the scripture tells us that he walked around in the city for a while and showed himself to over 500 people. Over 500 people saw him alive. I always wondered what happened to the other 380 that weren't in the upper room. I mean, couldn't they not fit? Were they... What happened to those people? You know, they saw him, and yet they weren't willing to follow him. And, and here we have Jesus telling them, wait, wait, wait till the promise comes. Stay there for a few days till the promise comes. I want you to think about yourself for a moment. How... How well do we do when we're waiting on God? And we've prayed and asked God for something and we're not getting an answer and a day goes by. And then we pray again and ask and the next day we don't get an answer. And he says, wait, wait. And then the third day, then the fourth day, then the fifth day, nothing. Then the sixth day, then the seventh day, then the eighth day nothing then the ninth day how would you have liked to have been the person who was in the upper room and then on the ninth day decided you know I got better things to do and then they left it's just like Saul right before God shows up listen God is pull right when you're ready to pull the trigger for you to do what you think is best the Holy Spirit is pulling up in your driveway Control yourself. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord. So what do you do while you wait? Ah, oh, you read the story. Pray. And how do you pray? Well, it says that they prayed continuously. They prayed continuously. And it wasn't a... I, I, I'm imagining in that moment in the upper room, it wasn't prayers of like, God, are you going to show up today? I imagine that that moment in the room, those prayers were, we are so excited. Not only is Jesus alive and we saw him go up to heaven, but he's going to send his promise to us that the prophets have been talking about throughout history. We're going to be here to see history made right here. Guys, gals, this is amazing. I bet their prayers were just intense. And you know, 
God still wants to pour out his spirit on all flesh today. It wasn't just for those people in that upper room. He says, this promise is to you and to your children and to those who are afar off who will ever believe. It's for us. For us. For us. For you. It's for you. The promise is for you. It's for you. Stop thinking that the promise is for like the the big ministry or it's for the person who has a TV show or for the for the great whatever minister or pastor, evangelist, prophet, teacher, whatever. The promise is for you. There are going to be some people on, on this side of earth, of heaven, excuse me, who have surrendered their lives fully to the Holy Spirit and you don't even know their names, but they're making the bigger impact than than I will ever make. They're making bigger impacts than the biggest names in, in ministry that you may have ever heard of. Why? Because there's, they've received the power, they're waiting on the Lord, and God is using them. And in heaven, their reward is going to be huge. So when you're waiting, while you're waiting, pray. How do you pray? Constantly. And they also, there was another part of how they prayed. They prayed in one accord. Shows you that God loves Hondas. Right? That joke. What does that mean? They prayed in one accord. They prayed together. Do you know when you wait alone, you will lose your weight? When you're trying to do life alone, you're waiting alone, you're going to lose your weight. It's just a matter of time before you're like, man, I've been, I've been praying for 20 minutes. Oh, God, I'm worn out. Okay, how many days? A few days? Uh, keep praying. But when you're praying with other people, when you're praying with other believers, when you're praying in one accord continuously, your prayers encourage one another. We need one another while we're waiting so that we don't do what Saul did, so that we don't jump out here and take matters into our own hands, so that we don't find the very thing that God has given us being taken from us God says I have a promise for you I have a promise for you the spirit of the Lord when, when Jesus stood up he was the first time he speaks in the temple when he stands up to preach that day it says he unrolled the scroll he was, he was preaching from what Isaiah had written about and now he's saying today this is fulfilled and you know what he says in that moment he says the spirit of of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to do what to preach the good news to to give sight to the blind to heal those who are sick to set the captive free and he continues to say church this is the ministry that I have given to you and if you will wait on the power of the Holy Spirit you can walk in victory in this in this life now today today we have access to the precious promise of the Holy Spirit. I want you to stand to your feet. And we're going to do what we've been preaching about for the last 40 minutes. We're going to take a moment and just wait. Okay? let the piano play and I want you to close your eyes for a moment and I want you to just wait and once again invite the Holy Spirit to come if, if you have found that you're Christian walk has been powerless today 
say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. I need you. I need you. See, but I received the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Yes, you, you did receive the Holy Spirit. But the book of Acts tells us that, tells us that there's a power that comes post-salvation. That there's a, not just a one-time infilling, that we are, we are to pray to continually be filled. Continually be filled. So we're continuing to ask today, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Do in me, Lord God, what I... I, I don't even understand. I'm trusting you, God. I'm trusting that I may not know all about you, this third person of you, the Holy Spirit. Today, I'm inviting you to teach me. I'm inviting you to fill me. And Lord, while I don't know what all the minor details of my life, I do know that you've called me to preach that the kingdom of heaven has come and to share the good news that Jesus saves and to pray for people who are sick and to pray for people who are in bondage to sin and to Satan so that they would be free and I can't do that on my own. I cannot do that in my own strength. I need your Holy Spirit today. So Holy Spirit, come. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me with power. Clothe me from on high. And I will continue to wait. Not just in this moment, but every day. I'm going to continue to wait for your infilling, for your overflowing, and your power. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, would you teach us how to wait? Teach us how to wait on you. We give you permission to slow our roll give you permission today to awaken us to a new reality of life in the spirit, not in the flesh. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I want to encourage you to continue to wait. Not just because this moment, uh, not just in this moment, but every moment. Start looking for moments to wait on the Lord. Start looking for opportunities to wait on the Lord. And then start listening and looking for His leading to then put it into action. You know, it's one thing to, when the Bible says that they were supposed to tarry until the Holy Spirit come, there are people who I know have become professional tarriers. We're just waiting. We just, we're still waiting. We're still waiting. You, you mean he hasn't done anything in your life? You're, he, hasn't, he hasn't filled, he hasn't given you power? He says if you ask, he would give it to you. He's not, it's not a, a magical formula. He says when your heart says, I want it, he will give it to you. So we've asked, Lord, we want your spirit. He's going to give it to you. I think that, it's important to know that we continue to wait and we continue to act. And we wait and we act. And sometimes we think the waiting means inaction. But it's all together. I'm waiting and I'm acting. I'm waiting and I'm acting. Does that make sense? Are you guys awake? All right. Good, because we're going to shout and then go out. You're going to go do what we've all talked about. Ready? Ready? Friday night's a night of worship. We're going to come and wait on the Lord. Amen.
So we're going to take communion together. We're going to wait on Jesus and celebrate his goodness in our life. Okay, on the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Lead someone to life. Amen. Go do it.